Hey folks, Real Honesty with John Ritlin. I'm John Ritlin, and with SummerSlam less than a month away, I figure why not do some SummerSlam themed shows? I'm not going to do an entire history <clears throat> of all the SummerSlam events from like 88 to 2017. I ain't got the time to do that. Maybe I'll do it sometime next year, <clears throat> but I've decided that I'm just going to also do an occasional series. This is going to be the top 10 best SummerSlam main event matches. One to close the show, obviously. Not the best, not the top 10 best SummerSlam matches, because this list would be drastically different. There would be a few ones that would be <clears throat> a little more, you know, a little higher and some that would be lower. And I'm also going to be doing some SummerSlam reflect reflection series. Easy for me to say. On at least 1992, 1997, um, 2002, possibly 2007 also. Maybe even 2012. <clears throat> because the reflection shows, people seem to enjoy those. And quite frankly, that's all I really have time for. So let's get on with it. Top 10 best SummerSlam main event <clears throat> matches. Number 10, Brock versus Cena. Because Cena got mauled. He got mauled. It was fucking amazing. I absolutely loved it. And I loved it because... It's what we needed to see. Now, I didn't have any desire to see a John Cena title reign again. But what was nice <clears throat> is seeing Brock just absolutely destroy Cena. This is what should have happened at Extreme Rules 2012. This, I think, would have been actually even better if we had seen that and then this. And then Cena could have, you know, maybe gotten a win back at some point. But I just love to get Brock just destroyed Cena. because, And I remember being just really happy on Twitter... <clears throat> if I had actually been doing uh, pay-per-view reviews at the time, I didn't start them until Survivor Series 2014. I would have just been all crazy. But this was great. And Brock won. Sure, he didn't defend the title very often after that, but hey, it was a great mauling of Cena. Number 9, Punk versus Jeff Hardy. CM Punk versus Jeff Hardy TLC match for the World Heavyweight Championship. It was great. It was great stuff. <clears throat> great commentary. And I believe it was JR and Todd Grisham, which, yes, Todd Grisham even did a pretty good job on commentary. But it was it was obvious that Jeff Hardy was going to lose. Because, of course, it was a match that he was so skilled in, could Punk win, of course he was going to. Reports have been going out that Jeff Hardy was going to be gone from the company soon anyway. And Jeff was going to lose, but <clears throat> they had a really good view. It's a shame that at the time, now, I mean, this isn't the case now, Jeff was a bit unreliable because of his drug his drug habits. He has gotten clean sense. And I mean, I yes, I ranted a ton in my top 40 least favorite wrestlers uh, series. I believe it's part two where I mentioned Jeff Hardy and about how he blew a lot of chances. And he did. And he's admitted in interviews he regretted. And I've seen those interviews. And yes, I'm, I'm done. I got that, it, <clears throat> that stuff out, out of my system, all that anger. <clears throat> Punk and Jeff Hardy had, in my opinion, one of my favorite feuds ever. If I had to make a top 25 feuds in all companies, it would be on there. I don't know if it'd be beyond 20, you know, 20, you know, maybe the top 20. But it was really good because, by the way, I sided with CM Punk because I agreed with him. Um, as for the match, though, really good. And CM Punk got the win, as he should have. Of course, Jeff Hardy did an insane swanton. Off a huge ladder through the announcer's table. That's what Jeff Hardy does. He just does crazy shit. And it was good. And Punk got the win. And then, you know, he's staying over Jeff Hardy at the end. Lights go out. <clears throat> then the gong. And Jeff Hardy's suddenly gone when the lights come on. And Undertaker's staying underneath Punk and then picks him up and choke slams him. But it was a good end to... 2009 SummerSlam really wasn't that bad. <clears throat> and I will also be talking about... Briefly, the top 10 best and top 10 worst SummerSlam pay-per-views, and then go a little deeper with some of them in my pay-per-view reflections. But Punk vs. Jeff Hardy was really good, and now another CM Punk match. Punk vs. John Cena. And by the way, Punk vs. Brock Lesnar would have been number, <clears throat> would have actually probably been higher on this list, and would have actually been on this list had it main evented the 2013 SummerSlam, but it didn't. But CM Punk vs. John Cena, 2011 SummerSlam. Triple H special guest referee, <clears throat> who was going to be the undisputed WWE champion, it was CM Punk. It was good. It was good stuff. Punk got the win, as he should have. And then, of course, Triple H raised his hand and 
walked out of the ring, Punk celebrated, and then Kevin Nash slowly, slowly, slowly making his way through the crowd. It was a good pop, and 2011 SummerSlam was a, actually a really, really, probably the last really great SummerSlam event that they've had, like, top to bottom on the card. <coughs> it, you know, at least for the most part. But it was it was really, really enjoyable. Really enjoyable. Diesel, well, Kevin Nash. Power bombs Punk, and then Punk gets, you know, cashed in by Del Rio. And this was going to lead to a Punk versus Triple H feud, and it just, I mean, which, having a night champion, it, 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 that's all in our story for another day, but it was a good match and a good clash. It was not as good as their Money in the Bank match. And their Money in the Bank match, honestly, the crowd made the match even better than it was. The match wasn't average by any stretch of the imagination. It was a good match. But the crowd made it even better because of the high stakes. Mmm, stakes. Punk vs. Cena was really, really good, and that's why it's number eight. Number seven, Brock vs. Rock, 2002, because they had to follow Shawn Michaels' comeback match against Triple H when the crowd was all exhausted and Brock and Rock got the crowd back into it. Heyman went to <clears throat> the announcer's table because of a rock bottom, and Brock started to turn the crowd because at one point he had the, you know, the bear hug that he had and everything, and the crowd started to chant, let's go Lesnar, let's go Lesnar, and it was, it was great. People knew Rock was leaving. Brock managed to... Get a great F5 miniature, twist the arm, get an F5, spin him, slam him down, one, two, three. Brock Lesnar, youngest um, <clears throat> undisputed champion, youngest WWE champion ever. Great. It was great stuff, and it was a great ending to 2002, which may have actually been the greatest SummerSlam ever, or at least one of. Number six, Rock versus Angle versus Triple H, 2000 SummerSlam. Fun fact. Kurt Angle was knocked the hell out at this at one point in this match <coughs> on that pedigree spot. He went through the announcer's table. So it was actually Rock and Triple H having most of the match. And then Kurt got brought out and got beaten. Rock managed to get the win because, of course, he did. Because Rock had just won the championship just a month prior. And that King, well, actually, was it a month prior or was it two months prior? I think it was two months prior because King of the Ring was in June. So, yeah, it was two months prior. But he had just he had just won that, and it was great. It was great, great stuff. Great, great psychology. Rock and Triple H. Triple H may actually be Rock's greatest rival, besides Austin. Actually, Triple H might be his best rival. Austin may be his most famous rival, but Triple H may be the best because I think the matches that Rock and Triple H had were consistently better. When Rock and Austin touched, they they had great matches, but him and Triple H were more consistently great. My personal opinion. It was a great triple threat match, and Rock retained. And then Kurt Angle would win the title a little later at uh, No Mercy 2000 and hold it for a few months. And then number five, Undertaker versus Edge, Hell in a Cell match, 2008 SummerSlam. <clears throat> that was great. That was a great, great match. Great culmination of the rivalry, as it should have been. I mean, it was pretty much the blow-off to the rivalry, even though they would have matches afterwards. It was a great blow-off to the rivalry. And Edge got sent to hell, you know, being thrown through the ring. And then fire popped up because Edge, it's not like Edge wasn't out of the way of it. And he was gone for a few months. I can't remember if he had an injury or something. He had something and he had to work through it. And he got written off TV for a little bit. Which was fitting. And Taker should have won that, by the way. There was no reason for Edge to win Hell in a Cell there. It's a really, really good main event for 2008. It just... A lot of really, really good stuff. A lot of really good stuff, and they really turned it up in 2007, 2008 for their feud. And then Daniel Bryan <clears throat> versus John Cena, 2013 SummerSlam. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Cena did have that, you know, giant that 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 Mo Vaughn, you know, baseball reference, like um thing on his elbow, Barry Bonds like thing, except uh, Barry Bonds probably juiced his elbow pad also. <clears throat> because he needed elbow surgery. I don't... I, what, he needed surgery. I think he had torn muscle and there was all this fluid there or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was a it was an injury. But Daniel Bryan managed to beat John Cena with, you know, the running knee and everything and the clean as a whistle in the middle of the ring. Triple H, special guest referee. And the instant the Triple H stayed in the ring, I knew what was going to happen. But Daniel Bryan won. The crowd went crazy. Went crazy, went crazy. They had done well with Daniel Bryan and John Cena building up that feud for just about a month. Because he had just, John Cena had just beaten Dan, or not Daniel Bryan, but Mark Henry 
at Money in the Bank prior, like a month prior to that. <clears throat> and Daniel Ryan went crazy, like as the MVP of that, you know, uh, Money in the Bank All Stars match, where he just took out everybody, including Sheamus, who was injured for shit. Sheamus was injured for a good, a good while. I think he was injured for a good six months. But Daniel Bryan winning, cleans the whistle, and then Triple H celebrating everything, celebrating with him, staying in the ring. Randy Orton's music hits, and they go, here it comes. Here it comes. I mean, this is before the network, so <clears throat> I'm watching it with my friends. I'm like, here it comes. Here it comes. Pedigree kicks him. I'm screaming. I, I yell. I you know tweet out in all caps. I fucking called it. I mean, I think a lot of people did. I'm not saying I was the only one that called it, but... Triple H turned on Daniel Bryan, Orton gets the cash in, Orton gets the championship, and thus led to a lot of bad television in, 20, in the fall of 2013. And I'm not knocking them doing that. They, that was the right call. It really built to, you know, the fans really wanting to see Daniel Bryan as the champion. And it was totally WWE's call to do it. They absolutely wanted Daniel Bryan to be in the main event. They They, they didn't, but the fans forced it. <clears throat> and it was great. It's like and it's like WWE trying to force it with Reigns. It's not working. But it was a great match. Very good psychology. Really, re really, really solid wrestling. The whole turn at the end was absolutely wonderful. Number three, the British Bulldog versus Bret Hart at 1992 SummerSlam. I had this ranked number one original. Excuse me, originally. And as great as the match is, <clears throat> I have it ranked a little lower for a reason. And it's not anything against the guys. The match hasn't lost its luster over time. But I just feel that the other two matches were just a little better with the stakes being higher. Mm, stakes again. But Bulldog, it, it, you hear like, you know, Brett's interviews now and now you can kind of see, but Brett really had to, you know, really had to work hard to get Bulldog over and help him and everything. And it was just really, really good how... You know, Bulldog wasn't in shape at all, wasn't really, you know, all that great. And Brett guided him to a great match. And it, it was great stuff. I mean, and, you know, Davey, <clears throat> the thing about Davey Boy is just, he was so good that even at his worst, he really could coast and make it look effortless. And because of how great Brett was as a performer, you couldn't really tell. I mean, unless you, you know, hear the interviews that Brett did, where he's done shoot interviews talking about it. You can't really tell that Bulldog is basically being guided through the whole match. That's just a testament to how great a performer Brett was. And also, Bulldog was a really good performer. It's a shame he never became world champion. One could argue he should have, and he probably would have, had he not been buying HGH or Roy's or whatever from a dealer, same with Warrior, because, oh, big shock, Warrior did that stuff. Not that a lot of other wrestlers didn't. But Bulldog might have been that, but no, he he, he got this great moment winning the IC title, and then, unfortunately, right before uh, Survivor Series 92, lost it to Shawn Michaels on the last Saturday Night's main event for uh, about almost 14 years. Yeah, to Shawn Michaels. And then Shawn Michaels faced Bret Hart in a champion versus champion match at uh, Survivor Series 1992, which I will be doing a reflection on that. I will actually do a reflection on Survivor Series 87, 92, 97. Ooh, that's going to be a good one. 2002, 2007. And that's probably going to be about it. Anyway, the bulldog Bret match is absolutely tremendous. It's one of Bret's best matches and probably Bulldog, besides maybe the match that he had with Owen Hart, in the European Championship Finals, March 3rd, 1997, that might be Bulldog's best match. Bulldog is great. And it's, it's, it's so sad that he died before the age of 40. Um, great match, though. Great match for the IC title. Back when the IC title actually meant something. Now, I'm not saying now Miz is at least trying to make the IC title matter, but WWE doesn't care. Number two, Vader versus Shawn Michaels, 1996. Vader should have fucking won this. And the fact that Vader didn't win this was disappointing. Um, in fact, I'm actually going to be doing a fantasy book on how WWE should have booked Vader, um, during his run. Or at least during the first couple years of his run. Um, but Vader should have won this. I mean, Sean was, of course, a little bitch, big shock. That's, that's part of the reason why Sean, even though he's on my top 50 favorite wrestlers of all time, <clears throat> Sean was a bitch. 
and this whole born again thing. I mean, okay, good for him. Good for him. I just, you just can't change the past. I mean, he, he's apologized for it, to be fair. Vader should have won this, though. I mean, I think even Cornette. Maybe would agree he should have won. I don't know. I mean, I've 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 heard Cornette talk at uh, at some points about this in interviews. <clears throat> I love Jim Cornette. His his interviews are just great. His pieces, his you know knowledge of the sport. Even if I don't agree with everything, it's nice to hear how spoken he is. But this was a great match, and of course they did a bunch of fall finishes. They did a, they did a count out. <clears throat> where Vader won it, DQ, where Vader won, and then Sean won, you know, in the end, because Sean Michaels always had to win. I think the boyhood dream should have ended here, and Vader kind of won the championship. And actually, I'll be doing my fantasy booking of Vader's WWE run very soon. Probably, if it doesn't drop by <clears throat> the beginning of August, it'll be up by the second week of August. Anyway, great match, though. Sean did win. Vader should have won. Number one. Undertaker versus Bret Hart, 1997 SummerSlam. Why Shawn Michaels was the special guest referee. If Shawn didn't call down the middle, I believe he would be fired. And if Bret lost, he would not be able to compete in the United States again. And Undertaker was a WWF champion, WWE champion, and he had managed to... <clears throat> um, him and Bret, I think their worst match was like a BB+. Plus. The, the matches I've seen, at least. Like, Taker and Brett always worked well together. And it was a seamless way that they transitioned from one feud to the next. Because, of course, you had Brett and Sean having their contentious, uh, you know, you know, working relationship and this kind of stuff. And they're building feud, you know, uh, because Brett was upset that Sean didn't want to drop the title to him at uh, WrestleMania 13. And in the Sunny Days promo, because that was professional Sean, coked up madman. Um, he's not coked up now, but he was back then. And banging Sonny. Gross. Um, Taker, though, had a good feud with Brett. Sean, of course, taking a chair from Brett and almost went went to hit Brett and ended up being Taker. Had to count, the count, didn't want to, was upset. But then the transition from Brett and Taker and Brett and Sean to Sean and Taker for the next couple months, which was a really great feud in the first ever Hell in a Cell match. It came up a little bit later. And yes, I will be re uh, doing a 20-year reflection on Bad Blood 1997. Those are my top 10 best SummerSlam main event matches. What are yours? Do you agree, disagree with what I said? Like, share, comment, subscribe. Twitter link is in the description. It's been Real Honesty with John Rithlin. I'm John Rithlin. I will see you soon.